So, my name is Anna Salomon. Um, I'm executive director of the Center for Applied Rationality. Uh, and the Center for Applied Rationality is a new nonprofit aimed at increasing people's competence and the quality of their lives and decision making, especially knowledge about the world, through what we're calling rationality training. So, the Center for Applied Rationality does what we're going to call rationality training. Um, and here's the idea. So, um, here's a graph of how competent people are over time, and we start out like more primordial ooze, and we're not very competent at all, and then sort of evolution happens, and eventually you get to a level where people become able to invent science, right? Mm -hmm. And it's because we're at the level where we're able to invent science, and we have things like video cameras, and so on, that we're like actually you know, having this sort of conversation today, able to reflect, etc. Um, what that means is you can think about humans as sort of the stupidest creatures you could have that are minimally capable of having this sort of conversation. If it was possible to have this conversation at any lower level, we'd be having it back there, right? Um, and what that means is that although we're able to do science with difficulty, since about maybe Galileo's time, before then we tended to argue about like what physics was by figuring out what Aristotle really meant about physics, right? Um, although we're barely minimally able to do science, um, there are a lot of the same heuristics that are useful for science or useful for arriving at correct beliefs more generally that do not come intuitively at all. So sometimes, you know, I'll show an essay I've written to a friend and I'll be like, can you critique my essay for me? And they'll come up with some helpful comments and I'll be like, mm, let me find all the reasons why your comments aren't right. <laughs> right? Um, so the Center for Applied Rationality is about looking, like using the fact that we finally, my diagram wasn't the most helpful, but we're finally at a point where we have science, like so we have this theory, study of human error patterns coming out of um, like Kahneman's work, heuristics and biases literature. We have the study now of like what kinds of, like, I mean, it's not just right now, it's been building over several decades, but we know a lot now both about how humans tend to reason and about how humans ought to reason, like what kinds of reasoning work. So like Bayesian math of how, what kind of reasoning would work, mathematics of how to find goals, like if you're an optimizing agent with a limited amount of time and money and so on. Um, Excellent. So, CIFAR trying to use this kind of science to build habit training exercises that actually really impact the way you think and the way you make decisions in your daily life. Um, so, the unique thing is we're, like, academic research is very good, but it's of necessity, but it's very careful, and because it's very careful, it's very slow. So they'll come up with one technique and, you know, two years later we'll have a published peer-reviewed test of that one technique, right? Um, CIFAR, in some ways we're more, do, we're doing engineering more than science. We're taking a bunch of ideas from the academic literature and from our personal experience, jamming them together into workshops that test like the conglomeration of 50 techniques at once, not one technique. Um, but we're still doing the rigorous tracking to find out, in a randomized fashion, to find out what kind of effect it has. Not what kind of effect that technique has, because if we wanted to do that for all 50 techniques, we would be doomed. But what kind of effect the conglomerate has to make sure we're not fooling ourselves. Um, what effect do I predict it will have? It's always dangerous. Um, uh, I think that it... Who knows? You ask me in a year and they'll give you the real answer. But... Um, I mean, I think that it will show, a lot of people come to our workshops and it helps, it seems to precipitate significant life changes for many people. Like they decide, man, I was in art, architecture school, I thought that uh, art history was just the thing I needed to do, but it turns out that even though I spent the last four years on it, I can actually switch paths, and I want to switch paths, something like that. It's not like, but the last four years will have been wasted, okay, that's a sub cost, I'm going to move on, that kind of thing. Um, I think it will show a s l larger portion of significant life changes. I hope it will show um, increased happiness, less feeling of stuck. Um, 
Not as sure about income. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Certainly for some people it does all of these things. But, you know, there's selection bias. The people who come and talk to you are the ones who are like, yeah, I came to your workshop and then I realized I should renegotiate with my boss and I got a raise and I improved my life. You know, we get a lot of those stories, but it's hard to know how representative they are, which is why we're tracking. Mm, fantastic. Um, I also predict that whatever the results are, they're going to improve over time. Our material is iterating rapidly. We're learning this stuff. We're trying to invent rationality in some sense. Drawing on many literatures, but jamming it all together in a mixed up real life pool in a way that academic research is in a less of a good position to do. So we're a young organization and our knowledge base is improving rapidly. We're mostly trying to be very empirical about figuring out which methods to test. So we run a lot of free test sessions where we test our material out and see which things resonate for people. Um, because the first step is people have to like, like it and understand it and use it. We do follow-up surveys to find out, you know, so you came to a class and you were excited, are you actually doing anything different two weeks later? Um, so you want them to be happy, you want it to actually impact behavior, and then you also want that impacted behavior to impact to be useful. This is the hardest part to test, but we are testing it. Um, so, for example, we randomized admissions to our June workshop, meaning we admitted twice as many people, like, we stepped twice as many people as we had slots in a hat, asked them all if they would promise to, like, do surveys and to attend the camp if they were chosen. Um, they all promised. We pulled half of them out of the hat. They came to the camp. The other half, which is you know, identical in its properties, were not allowed to come to the camp, and we're tracking both groups to find out if, in fact, this, these techniques that we believe work actually work for increasing both people's rationality according to a variety of measures and people's life success according to a variety of measures. Life success being things like income, happiness, relationship satisfaction, etc. Research takes time, but I'm excited about the rate at which things are improving. So we're just finding out if having additionally our training is helpful relative to what people would ordinarily do with the year. And even if it comes out, that won't show that it would work on most people, it'll just show that it would work on the kind of people who would tend to sign up for our workshops. But for anyone thinking about signing up for our workshops, that's sort of the right question, right? I mean, uh, eventually it would be nice to be able to propagate this stuff until we get to something that would work on, say, the average high school student. But it's harder to get it to work on the average high school student than on sort of an unusually smart, unusually motivated adult. So we're starting there, and then we'll try and adapt the curriculum further once we hit the easiest target set. I think one of the biggest takeaways that people have from attending our workshops is just the feeling that there are so many dimensions they can optimize. Like, you know, most of the time, you know, like, I know a couple who've lived in the same house for 15 years and they still disagree with one another about how to get from their house to the freeway, right? And they're both pretty confident. Most of the time we have our own pattern of doing things, we're just pretty confident about it, you don't even think about it, you don't even feel confident about it, you just sort of do it. Um, our workshops give people a lot of tools for sort of realizing how many parameters there are to what they're doing. You know, when you sit down to think, do you use concrete images, do you not use concrete images? Do you ever set a timer and brainstorm? What pieces of it, do you make sure that you're curious about what you're doing? When you read, how do you read? Have you spent some hours thinking about how fast you read and how to make it better, how to increase your comprehension? Just the feeling that there's a huge number of twistable knobs in our life, most of which we're ignoring and many of which it's actually very easy to begin playing around with and getting some gains. Maybe, like me, you've had the experience of like, you're trying to write a program, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you, you, you come up with it, and here it is, it's your pile of code, and when you plug in one number at the beginning, a different number comes at the end, and you think it's right. And then you plug in your test case, mm -hmm. and let's say you plug in zero, and you've already figured out that when you put zero into your program, seven had better come out, right? Uh, but instead, out pops six. And you're like, gosh darn it. How about if I, I know how to patch this code, how about if I just write plus one? Okay, and now when you plug in zero, seven indeed comes out. That's good. But the problem is, maybe you gummed up what's happening to some of the other numbers, right? Um, I think this is actually a very... Gener I think this is a metaphor for something that happens a lot in our thinking. So let's say that I'm on a diet, 
and then I'm walking down the street and I see some pizza and the pizza feels, smells really good and I find myself coming up with lots of reasons why in fact pizza is on my diet. Um, it seems to me that coming up with all the reasons why pizza is on my diet is kind of like adding plus one there. Like it's jury rigging it so that when um, pizza goes into the function, eat will come out of the function. Um, and maybe I'm doing it, but maybe that is the right answer for pizza. Like the problem with doing this is not that I, like the problem with rationalization in that context is not that I end up eating the pizza. It's that in the course of concluding that pizza is really on my diet, I've messed up my model of a lot of other things. I've sort of gummied up other parts of the code. Um, I think this is a general principle that happens across many different domains of rationality. Um, so analogously, you know, uh, let's say that um, I got in a fight with somebody and I'm like trying to explain all the reasons why indeed we should organize the office this way and not that way. Um, the, and then I, in the course of this I find myself thinking up reasons why the other guy's a jerk, right? The problem with this is not that it's letting me defend that the art office should be this way. It's that somehow instead of being able to pull apart the issues in my head and thinking about whether the which way the office actually should be while reasoning forward to the conclusion instead of backward to justify my conclusions. In the course of doing this, I'm, you know, believing all kinds of false things about the other guy, like trying to just ram it into having my conclusion instead of trying to carefully debug what's going on in my thinking. So Spark is one of the workshops that we run. Um, Spark is targeted at high and is run for high school students with exceptional math ability. So, uh, people between ages about 14 and 18 who are in the top 50 in the U.S. roughly speaking in mathematics. Um, and it's basically the same as our adult courses, except that we are able to pack in far more technical material. Um, so, in particular, we draw on the theory of artificial intelligence. The reason we draw on that is the theory of artificial intelligence is the theory of like how to program a machine to do inference correctly. That has a lot of bearing on what kinds of inference do and don't work when we do it. Um, and it's a theory that these kids can pick up really quickly. Although for some in some of our in some of our adult workshops we draw on the same technical material. In some of our adult workshops we focus on the qualitative takeaways because you can train your brain to do basically the right patterns without understanding the technical back structure. But it is in fact very helpful to understand the technical back structure for those for whom that comes easily. So getting rationality courses online is on our eventual to-do list. Um, yeah, we may, we may make preliminary efforts toward that in the next few months or not. Um, getting a whole course online is a lot of a, a difficulty, but getting a video lecture or two online is more plausible for the near term. Um, the, night, the reason we've been focusing on workshops up front is because workshops are very interactive, very dynamic. We're still developing this material. Um, and we'll have very confident workshop participants coming in who have their own techniques, and we'll have our own techniques, and it's just a very organic process in which new ways of thinking about thinking, new ways of sort of noticing the mistakes that you're making, and getting your brain to want to notice the mistakes you're making, and developing a positive affect, and so on. Like, just lots of new material sifting around in the cauldron, and workshops are in fact a very efficient format for developing that material long term. But yes, um, getting it to everybody is on the to-do list. Uh, group rationality, getting a group of people to come to an accurate conclusion instead of getting an individual by themselves to come to an accurate conclusion. Uh, we do some exercise, I mean, so for example, whiteboards are great because uh, working memory, the number of items that you can hold in your head at the same time, is one of the strongest correlates of intelligence, and having paper or a whiteboard or something to hold some of those pieces is almost working extra working memory. It's like free, right? Like free intelligence. In the context of a whiteboard, it's like free, a part of your mind that's shared across the group. Um, I find that between, I find that many conversations get much better when you start do something as simple as like adding a whiteboard. Um, you can do more complicated things. We play games called the update a game called the updating game, for example, in which we go around the room, we choose any question that has an answer that we don't know, like, I don't know, when was Abraham Lincoln born? How many pounds is a blue whale? 
how big is how many dollars per year is the insurance industry in Phoenix, Arizona, whatever. Um, then you go around the room, everybody states their impression. Then after you've had everyone's impression, you can sort of think and be like, ah, uh, you know, he seems like he knows what he's doing, he said that, so maybe so you get to revise it, and then a minute later you get to find out the answer. And so you learn how to what kind of trust to put in other people's opinions, whether you should stick to your own opinion more, whether you are systematically under updating from other people's info. And there's a lot of other such techniques. Calibration is an individual exercise where you learn that when you feel absolutely certain, what does that mean? Does it mean it happens 100% of the time? But it should actually mean it happens like 67% of the time, two-thirds of the time. One, that is, one-third of the time when you're absolutely certain, you're wrong. Fascinating fact about humans. Um, the updating game is a more complicated thing. It's a part of group rationality rather than individual rationality. And it's about learning how much to update from other people's opinions. Yeah, I wish we had the research to answer that question. Um, certainly we've had people of all ages attend our workshops and many have, many say they've found it useful and many go on in the follow-up surveys to report that they're thinking differently and using different techniques in their everyday thinking. Um, um, I'd say, but I mean, this is a horribly self-serving answer, but you might consider, in order to best bias, trying out our workshops. Whereas we have, for example, a calibration app, it's uh, you know still sort of being alpha tested or maybe beta tested. But um, so you have a bunch of questions like when was Abraham Lincoln born? You have some buttons that you can click on like I'm fifty. So sorry, was Abraham Lincoln born before or after 1900? I guess you've got some buttons you can click like 50% confident, 70% confident, 99% confident. Okay, so then you answer a whole bunch of these questions and maybe you said that you were 99% confident on you know, a whole bunch of them and then it tells you, okay, of the ones where you were 99% confident, for how many of them were you right and for how many of them were you not right? Um, and let's say for a lot of people, so if you're well calibrated and you're 99% confident, then let's say that you answer 100 of them and are 99% confident. 100 questions for which you're 99% confident, you should be like, right 99 times and wrong one of them, right? Um, but for real people in psychological studies, when they do this, if you're 99% confident, in fact, you're right not once, but maybe about 33 times out of 100. Which means that you're absolutely certain doesn't mean what you think it means. Um, and you can train with this app and get it so that you actually are much better calibrated.